the catastrophic crash of the Polish Air Force One in Smolensk, Russia, on April the 10th, 2010, took place while the official Polish delegation, with the President of Poland on board, was on its way to the Katyn Forest to pay respect to the victims of the Katyn massacre on the 70th anniversary of this horrific, unpunished crime of World War II. In order to understand the dimension of the Smolensk crash, a significance of the occasion of this journey must be taken into account. In April and May 1940, the Soviet NKVD conducted countless mass executions of the Polish officers held as prisoners of war and patriotic elements of the Polish society from the conquered Poland. This deluge of mass exterminations was conducted in accordance with Stalin's execution order issued on March 5, 1940. About 22,000 of the best and the brightest sons of Poland were secretly exterminated with a shot in the back of the head, the Katyn style. To the world, this horrific crime is known as the Katyn massacre because the first mass graves of this genocidal operation were discovered in the Katyn forest near Smolensk. The Katyn crime has been aggravated by a despicable Katyn lie and conspiracy of silence effectively implemented after the war. To this day, the Katyn crime has not been properly investigated, adjudicated and punished. Those who perished in the Katyn Hecatomb are yet to rest in peace since the moral calculus that brings about reconciliation and closure has not been worked out with respect to the Katyn victims. Hence, to this day, Katyn remains the greatest festering wound of World War II. So uh, for that anniversary, there was a plan for um, the president and the prime minister to commemorate those this anniversary together in Katyn, near Smolensk in Russia. And it, initially it's supposed to be a joint uh, visit between the prime, uh, prime minister and the president. But at the beginning of 2010, the message was that the Polish Prime Minister, Mr. Donald Tusk, will go on a different uh, trip together with Prime Minister uh, Vladimir Putin on April the 7th, and then President Kaczynski will uh, commemorate the anniversary as an official delegation on April the 10th. So basically from one visit, uh, this was split into two visits. And Prime Minister Tusk went on April the 7th, landed in Smolensk. This was a military airport, uh, which was normally closed, but it was specifically prepared and open for, the, for this occasion. So on the 7th, uh, Prime Minister Putin and Prime Minister Tusk landed at the Severny Airport, military airport in Smolensk. And on the 10th, the official Polish delegation crashed. So we lost, Poland lost, uh, the uh, president of Poland, uh, Lech Kaczyński, with his wife, this is Anna Valentinovich, who is the real symbol of the Solidarity Movement. If some of you may recall, Solidarity Movement is the, uh, the movement that led to the demise of the uh, Soviet Union and uh, basically is, is contributed with uh, ending the Cold War the way we know it. At least that was the official version until now, until these days. But unfortunately what happened was that uh, Solidarity was split and the so-called roundtable discussion uh, incorporated a, a part of the Solidarity Movement into the communist group and really controlled Poland for the past 25 years. And the fraction of the Solidarity Movement that collaborated with former communists was led by Lech, Lech Wałęsa. 
Some of you probably heard news about Lech Wałęsa being a collaborator for the Soviet Communist Security Services. So this is very important because in Poland we have a split between the solidarity that went for collaboration with communists and solidarity which opposed that. This conflict is at the, at the foundation of the context of this tragedy. And we also lost 10 generals of the Polish uh, armed forces, uh, basically the entire central command of the Polish armed forces. Um, this is the flight. Uh, this was, like I said, the April 7, uh, a successful landing. I must say that the pilot who crashed on the 10th was the second pilot, actually flew to Smolensk on the 7th as the second pilot. Before the crash, uh, there was a landing of the Polish Air Force uh, Yak number 40, flight 440. This flight landed in Smolensk before the crash about at 7.45 a.m. Then we have two attempts of the Russian EU-76. Uh, the Russian EU was making two approaches for landing at, at Smolensk between uh, 7.30 and 7.40, like you see, and then around 8 o'clock a.m. And then uh, the fatal cr crash took place at 8.41. Uh, this is the uh, flight plan, military, and you have all the data here from uh, Warsaw, Okęcie, destination Smolensk North, uh, secondary air force indicated, and this is the Polish air force uh, flight, military air flight. Uh, this is excerpt from the transcript according to the Russian report. You can see that um, this is the approach from the Russian uh, control, uh, air traffic control. Uh, eight kilometers on course on glide path, on course on glide paths. You can see consistently on course on glide path. In fact, the airplane was consistently outside of the deviation zone all this time. So it was mis misleading misleading uh, commands. Uh, this is also what we have in the transcript, uh, that at, uh, at the uh, 100 meter altitude, the decision altitude for go around, the pilot, mm -hmm. uh, the navigator says 100 meters, pilot in command uh, gives the command to go around, uh, second pilot repeats the command, a command uh, and that's where the recording ends. In fact, the recording ends before uh, the plane hits the ground. Okay, this is, this is how the uh, wreckage was handled after the crash, immediately after the crash. And the question is why the windows are so significant? Uh, we are wondering whether the, the internal pressure could be um, uh, recorded and memorized in the, in the windows uh, structure. This is, you can see they are putting a, a new road and it's being built with a, a, um, concrete being poured over the crash site. Uh, 
uh, but basically this option was rejected and uh, for some reason the Polish public was convinced that this uh, investigation will be conducted under the uh, Chicago Convention for the civil aircraft and for two years the Polish public opinion was, co uh, was being informed that this was a, a civilian airplane with a pilgrimage to the, the holy site kind of a, a, you know, ridiculing the situation. So eventually the, the crash was handled, because obviously it was outside the jurisdiction of the Chicago Convention, so they, they eventually came with the idea of conducting the investigation under Annex 13 to the Chicago Convention. So in other words, the procedure will be implemented according to Annex 13. The consequences of that are that the Polish side is completely deprived of any mechanism of appeal or enforcement, or, or basically the Polish side has no rights whatsoever in this investigation. Uh, now, what the Russians did, they, um, the, the day of the crash, President Medvedev appointed Prime Minister Putin as the investigator in charge. So uh, as of the moment of the crash, Mr. Putin was in charge of this investigation. Three days later, he issued a special order and uh, transferred the general supervision of the technical investigation and coordination of the investigation to the uh, Interstate Aviation Committee. We call it MAC. Uh, so uh, three days later, the uh, investigation after basically the, the crash was taken care of, if you will. Okay, the, the, the main pieces of the wreckage were moved aside and the, the, the key elements, the, the key data recorders and bodies were re relatively well moved uh, to another location. That's where Mac took over the investigation. Uh, that's the third day. So the Russians announced that they will, Mac will be conducting the investigation according to Annex 13 and the Polish government acquiesced. Uh, now, uh, this is very important for the families because there's a huge, a huge problem uh, with uh, treatment of the bodies and with treatment of the families. So basically, uh, Polish pathologists were not present at, uh, at the scene of medical examination or uh, only for the autopsy of the president, uh, the Polish pathologist was uh, allowed to participate. Uh, the cause of death for everybody was determined as the uh, multiple injuries due to airplane crash. In a very general sense, everybody the same. Uh, and what's dramatic is that uh, uh, the identification took place in Moscow under tremendous pressure in very hostile conditions. And uh, the families were told that the caskets will be sealed in Moscow after this investigation and will not be, it will not be possible to open the caskets in Poland before burial. So basically whatever Russians did in Moscow with the traumatized families, okay, whatever they did, they put into those caskets, that's what was buried in Poland. No one was allowed to open the caskets or to, to, to conduct any autopsy or, in fact, it was a violation of the Polish law because when the Polish citizen dies abroad, the law mandates autopsy performed by the Polish authority. And this was in violation of the Polish law. If, if the caskets are returned to Poland, with the bodies, why can't Poland then just have the caskets opened up in another autopsy performed at that time? Because the government of uh, Prime Minister Tusk did not allow for it. I see. Okay. The, Pol the Polish government that's right, okay. but you must remember right. that in Poland there is a very sure. difficult political situation right. Right. and you have the president from, from one party who died in the crash and prime minister from, uh, from the opposition party. So you have a clear, a very sharp and dramatic political context which goes back to communist times, which goes back to communist and anti-communist. Okay. Um, so the, the bodies, have been mistreated in many ways. First of all, a, a horrible uh, a photography of a naked body of the dead president of Poland leaked to the internet, which caused trauma to the entire country. Then, like I said, uh, the, the problem, the, the families were not able to open the caskets, but then we had medical reports coming 
trickling, trickling in from Russia slowly. And the families were getting the reports that, you know, your father, for example, here's the body of a short man with dark hair, and your father was a, a tall blonde, right? Just a drastic example, but you had instances like that all over. So the families were appealing to the prosecutor's office and demanding exhumations and autopsy because they say this medical report does not, not match with the body of my loved ones. So after a huge fight, they were able to push through uh, for six exhumations because the prosecution realized that the bodies in those caskets were mixed up. Okay. So basically, they knew that the, the wrong body was buried in this grave. And among those that we know for sure that the bodies are mixed up and the, is Anna Valentinovich, we call her mother of the Solidarity Movement. Her body was misburied and they did exhume two, uh, two caskets, assuming that that were the so-called mistakes supposed to happen. It, uh, had, uh, they exhumed those bodies, but the family does not accept the other body as <coughs> Anna Valentinovich. So until today, we still don't know where Anna Valentinovich, we call her Anna Solidarity, where, she, where, where her body is. So those are a dramatic, dramatic uh, situation. We don't have time to go into details. Um, this is, uh, now, um, there is on the, on the internet, you can find a video. Uh, it's called one minute, 24 seconds video made at the crash site immediately after the crash by a bystander, by the passerby. And on that video, I don't have it here because we have no time, but you can find it. Uh, you can clearly identify gunshots gunshots from the crash site immediately, like 10 to 15 minutes after the crash. And then we have this, this photograph here, and I don't want to make a zoom of it, but you can, it's a very high quality photo. You have a body here of a gentleman on the ground, uh, taken, you see the, the date, uh, April the, uh, the 4th, 1450, okay? A couple hours after the crash. And uh, on that, on his skull, at the back, there is a, wound that reminds a gunshot wound. And uh, we, were, we asked uh, Dr. Michael Baden, uh, who is a famous American pathologist, uh, uh, to ex examine this photograph so that he can give you uh, some uh, of his opinion. Yeah, what, 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 wait a moment. Yeah, we, we don't want to provide the name. Crash site that was taken about four hours after the crash on April 10th 2010, he is lying on his uh, abdomen um, with the back of, the, of his head exposed, and on close examination, there is a circular perforation in the mid portion of the back of the head just above the level of the ears, and there is also a area of brain damage on the ground on the left side uh, which with what appears to be a mixture of blood and brain material that's on the ground uh, this is a very unusual type of injury uh, to be so narrow and it could be due to shrapnel when the uh, a small piece of shrapnel when the plane crashed. It could be shrapnel that was uh, caused by an explosive device. It could be evidence of um, a gunshot wound, or it could be uh, injuries suffered when uh, struck the ground. Um, but it is uh, uh, unusual to have these two separate injuries from striking the ground. There'd be uh, one side, not the other side. So it, it is uh, my opinion that I would strongly, strongly recommend that an autopsy be performed to uh, determine what caused the, the both injuries, the back of the head and the left side of the, of the head, that we see in this photograph. May I ask a question? Yes. Has uh, Michael Baden been recognized worldwide? 
why as an authority, okay, is he a criminal the one, pathology, right, he, was he privy to any uh, examination in Poland? How, how did that work? Yes, the families actually asked Mr. Baden to come to Poland when those bodies were exhumed and represent them in the autopsy pro, uh, pr uh, procedures. But Mr. Baden, even though he was next room, he was not allowed to the autopsy room. And uh, you know, it was also indicated that the autopsy are conducted only for the purpose of identification of the victims and not for determining the cause of death, which also led to some major problems as well. So uh, basically, according to Annex 13, Poland uh, was about to submit uh, Polish comments to the final draft of Russian report. But uh, at that time, Mr. Medvedev visited Poland and he said that he, he could not foresee any possibility that the Russian findings would differ from the Polish findings. Uh, but anyway, the Polish side went ahead with uh, uh, comments and included 222 uh, comments, questions and requests for clarification from the Russian side. Basically, Russia disregarded all those Polish comments and did not address 170 of those comments at all and addressed some completely irrelevant ones and issued its final report on January 19. Russia called a press conference that went uh, to, uh, was broadcasted all over the world. So um, in, in announcing their results, Russia blamed the Polish pilots the Polish generals and the Polish president for causing the crash. So those are the conclusions of the Russian report. A failure of the crew to take a timely decision to uh, proceed to the alternate airdrome. Descent without visual contact with ground references to the altitude much lower than minimum uh, in order to establish visual flight. No reaction to numerous house warnings which led to controlled flight into terrain, aircraft destruction, and death of uh, all the crew and passengers. And the final fourth point that I will be focusing on is the presence of the Commander-in-Chief of the Polish Armed Forces in the cockpit until the collision exposed a psychological pressure on the pilot in command decision to continue descent in conditions of unjustified risk with a dominating aim of landing at any means. So basically the Russians are blaming General Gwasik, uh, the uh, commander-in-chief of the Polish Air Force, for forcing the pilot to land at all costs against all the safety precautions. So basically Russians are claiming that General Gwasik was in the cockpit at the time of the crash. Uh, the Polish side clearly established beyond a reasonable doubt that the commander-in-chief was not present in the cockpit at the time of the crash. And there are many indications, including the location of his body on the crash site. There, no evidence exists of any psychological pressure on the pilot to land at all costs. Basically, there is an evidence, even in the Russian report, that contradicts landing at any means. Basically, from, from what we can see from the transcript, even uh, the Russian one, it, that pilot in command make one, tr one trial approach, not four, okay? Because the, there is a lot of misinformation, disinformation, and the, the reports initially uh, informed the public all over the world that there were four attempts at a, a landing. Now, this was the one and first and only approach. And he issued a go-around command at the decision altitude. Uh, now, the reason why, because of course, you know, even though the transcript says that he gave a command to go around at the proper altitude, uh, the Russians and uh, the, some Polish uh, people claim that he could have changed his mind at the last moment. But the, the state of mind of the pilot in command 15 minutes before the crash is indicated by this quote from the transcript. Uh, the pilot in command talks to the director of the protocol. Okay, and he says, Mr. Director, fog came out at this moment in these conditions that we have right now, we will not be able to land. We will make one approach, but most likely nothing will come out of it. This is a critical statement of the state of mind of the pilot in command before, the, uh, before landing. So uh, to argue that, you know, that what the Russians are saying is, well, if maybe that's what he meant 15 minutes before the crash, but then under pressure from the general, he changed his mind. 
Now, there is this, this nonsense attack on the General Blasik and basically blaming him for, uh, for the crash and many uh, tricks are being used and many, a lot of disinformation and manipulations is conducted for the past six years with respect to this one. So, uh, so what the Polish prosecution was able to establish is that according to the opinion, official opinion, the CBR recording does not provide any evidence which could justify a hypothesis that General Blasik exerted pressure and influence on the decision of the crew to land at all costs. Now, uh, what is very dramatic for, again, another traumatic event for the Polish people was that when General Anodina from MAC at the press conference issued the official conclusion and added on her own that the alcohol was detected in the blood of General Blasik, indicating indirectly that he was drunk. So you, can you imagine what kind of picture she's painting that this crazy general who was drunk, uh, flying for this very important occasion, he just uh, uh, burst into the cockpit and simply drove the plane to the ground. That's really what the Russians were saying. And the Polish prosecution said that no alcohol was provided that day for that flight. Another uh, theory to really uh, discredit General Blasik was that before the flight, he argued with the pilot in command and that everybody w was able to see that they had a, a, some kind of a, a, a confrontation. They also ruled it out and they said that this is a hearsay. <coughs> Now, what's, what's, what's important is that MAC was really focusing in its investigation on the psychological aspects of the pilot in command and of the situation of the special occasion. And what they were trying to portray the Polish people like, you know, uh, crazy zealots who were determined to get to that occasion at all costs and really focus on their state of mind and how they had a tunnel vision and all sorts of uh, psychological analysis. And they employed Mr. Mintusov, who was a, a political marketing expert. This is really what the Russians did. They focused on political marketing expertise in preparing their report. And this gentleman comes to Poland in 2013 and talks with a, a journalist in Poland, and he makes a statement like that. Obviously, no politician wants to be caught lying, but there always exists a room for interpretation. That is what happened with the voice of General Blasik on the uh, cockpit uh, CBR recorder. The voice could belong to uh, General Blasik or could belong to someone else. The emphasis on drunk General Blasik was an attempt to divert public attention away from the Russian mistake. That's what this pol uh, expert for political marketing said in a uh, discussion with, uh, with a Polish journalist. Did they do, with the voice on the voice recorder, did they do any voice analysis with? They didn't do a technical voice analysis, only by calling a friend to recognize the voice. Okay. Or an enemy, whichever you choose. <laughs> <laughs> now, what I want to make sure, okay, so the general, Blasik is really the scapegoat. He is really discredited. He is being attacked. He is being made uh, as a, as a ignorant, as incompetent, as really uh, you can imagine to put someone in, in such a position. I want you to know that he was a recipient of the Legion of Merit from the Department of Defense. Okay, for his exceptional meritorious service as the commander of the Polish Air Force from April 2007 to September 2009, okay? So Americans are recognizing this general as the especially uh, competent, especially important for the uh, integration of the Polish Air Force into NATO system. And they are awarding him and two other generals that, uh, that were also on that flight with the highest merit award by the United States for his exceptional contribution. So you can see here that this, this uh, a highly honored and respected general in the United States is being destroyed, discredited, and made, uh, made a symbol of, of incompetence worldwide. And bad character, because they claim he was drunk. 
Now, human rights violations with respect to the families of the victims. And we don't have time to go into those details, but um, the families were uh, treated in a similar way like the families of the Katyn victims, okay? This is a boilerplate analogy. Not only families were intimidated, uh, experts were intimidated and witnesses were intimidated, harassed, and the families were, uh, you know, obviously uh, the, 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 the Polish side and the Russian side were simply straightforward lying to the families, uh, of publicly offending the families in Poland, ridiculing the families, discrediting uh, witnesses and experts, discrediting, slandering the president, the late president Lech Kaczynski, because the argument was that he forced the general to land at any cost. And Russians even put in their MAC report a quote from the, from the CPR, he will go crazy. And that quote, they link to the, again, the psychological analysis that uh, the general says, or the pilot says, well, if I don't land, the president will go crazy, right? But this quote nev it was never to be found on the cockpit voice recorder. Ju Russians just made it up, just to fit their theory. So negative public image of the victims and discrediting criticism of the investigation, this investigation, uh, you know, whatever we are trying to do, independent investigators or the families or the experts, it is always being uh, labeled as a political game, okay? Because of course, this is a highly politicized and very inconvenient for everybody. But so whatever is being touched about this subject, it is, uh, it is discredited as a political game. And finally, of course, uh, ridiculing any discussion of a terrorist attack, uh, labeling this a conspiracy theory. Uh, this is Remigiusz Musz, who landed the Yak flight, Yak uh, airplane, um, an hour before the crash. This is the last flight that safely landed before the crash. That's why it is so important. So this is one of the top and priority witnesses in this investigation. And he was found dead at the cellar of his apartment on October 28, 2012. I must tell you that we have at least 30 deaths in Poland of people connected with the Smolensk crash, which are labeled as suicide. And we call them a serial suicide. This is was also a serial suicide. Uh, so uh, the, the violation of the, of the human rights of the families of the victims have uh, basically are violations of the European um, uh, Convention of Human Rights on several grounds. And this is one of them, inhumane and degrading treatment and also violation of due process of law. Uh, so those are fundamental premises of the Human Rights Convention, all Human Rights Convention, and massive gross violations of human rights. And uh, to, those are uh, problems with the Russian investigation. We don't have time to go into it, but there's a lot of IPEF materials that I will share with you. This is also destruction of evidence, manipulation of evidence. There is a, a lot of information on that. Uh, uh, Russia violated procedures of Annex 13 uh, everywhere, but there is no uh, uh, remedy <laughs> for those violations because it's outside any framework of, of law, so they can laugh into our face and do whatever they please. And there was an effort on the Polish side. The, the theory of pilot error was put forth to the public in Poland immediately with the announcement of the crash. And the, the, the government of Prime Minister Tusk sent text message to all his followers that uh, how to explain the crash, that this was a pilot error. And the general who revealed those directives, he also uh, lost his life. Uh, this was uh, uh, General Petelicki, uh, again, who revealed those directives uh, about the pilot error. He was found dead in June of 2012. What's important, Mr. Edmund Hill, please, a Polish accredited representative to MAP, okay, according to Annex 13, okay. This was, of course, in theory, in practice, he had no power and he couldn't do anything. But in theory, he was at least having that, that title. So he said, there was a tendency to show that the pilots were at fault. And of course, a lot of conflict of interest in those <coughs> groups. Uh, now, what we have on the Polish side, we had a technical investigation by the equivalent of the Polish NTSB, uh, the, the, the group that uh, submitted the Polish comments to the Russian report. 
They did submit those comments in December, Russians disregarded those comments, and in July, the Polish report really repeated the Russian conclusions. So, in July, Poland issued the official report which repeated the Russian conclusions, relied on the Russian investigation and on the Russian evidence, so the Polish side issued a report without access to anything. And up until today, Poland doesn't have access to the wreckage, to the black boxes, and the bodies, which are all direct evidence, are beyond access. Uh, so then we have Polish criminal investigation that is conducted up until now, and this is a, a hugely politicized investigation. Clearly, the explosives were found on the wreckage of that airplane, uh, and. Uh, there was a huge fight in Poland. The, the journalist who disclosed the, the results of those tests was fired. The uh, editor-in-chief of the whole newspaper was fired. The newspaper almost went out of business. And the official version of the chemical analysis of the explosives is it's a nonsense. But this issue has been dealt by a different body that I will just uh, address. So, after the Polish report was issued, and was clearly a contradictory report and insufficient report, the opposition, the group, uh, the political group that lost President Lech Kaczynski formed a parliamentary committee for investigation. And it was labeled as a political committee and uh, discredited. But now, when the opposition won in Poland power, they are back in power, so the parliamentary committee is uh, dissolved, but what happens is that the Polish NPSB renews its technical investigation right now. So the, the Polish technical investigation is being renewed and the Polish criminal investigation is ongoing. Is, there, a, is there then a possibility of the bodies being exhumed? Yes, 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 right now, yes. If those bodies in the meantime were not destroyed because that's a possibility. And the flight data recorder and the cockpit voice recorder has not been returned to Poland? No, not, not only that. We have copies, but each copy has a different length, and we have no, and no recording includes the last segment, the, the last second of the flight, okay? We are different, and so clearly there is a manipulation with the last second of the flight, both for cockpit voice recorders and for the flight data record, recorders. And one uh, flight data recorder, an analog one, was never found. Do you know if 96 bodies were returned? Uh, well, the uh, 96 caskets returned, but we don't know what's in those caskets. Now, uh, so parallel to the parliamentary committee investigation, there was a, a huge effort by the Polish academic community to address those obvious issues. And if you can imagine, the government issued an order that no uh, professor or anyone in, um, in academia could use academic facility for research on Smolensk. So those people couldn't do anything. They could not move their fingers at the Polish universities with respect to Smolensk analysis. So they formed independent group. They paid their own dues. They, they formed kind of an association outside of their schools and pursued four academic conferences, starting 2012, 13, 14, 15. A tremendous, tremendous accomplishment from various fields. Um, I have a book, those are uh, conference materials from Smolensk conferences. This is the first one. The second is twice as big. Those are all presentation academic uh, articles regarding Smolensk. You can find all of them in on uh, Conferencia Smolenska. This is the website here. Okay, everything is here, including the video presentations, including the papers. Some of them are in Polish, but many of them are in English. And it's a tremendous body of knowledge, including the chemi chemical analysis. I, I'll, I mentioned that. I know I'm late with my time. You know, when, when the, the Polish officials did the analysis of explosives, they said, we use four methods to prove whether the explosives were detected. And if all four methods proved uh, explosives, it means they were explosives. So they had three methods proving the explosive, one not. Okay, so they said no explosives. And the professor, uh, a chemistry professor at this conference said, yes, but that fourth method that you use would never 
be able to prove any explosives because it was not for that purpose. So, uh, and actually she's already dead, she passed away. So they used this, this, this system so that it will never show up exploded. Just to give you a, an example. Uh, and finally, my, my conclusion uh, is that I want to, um, this is very hard for us because we lost 10 generals uh, on this airplane, the entire central command of the Polish armed forces, and five of them were top NATO generals, including General Gongor, who was next in line for uh, command of the NATO forces in Europe. And all of top three of them, General Gongor, General Kwiatkowski, General Błasik, were the recipients of the Legion of Merit of the United States. So uh, basically the top command of the Polish Armed Forces was completely wiped out. And in those graves that they were going to Katyn, when we have 4,400 Polish officers, there were two Polish generals buried there. Thank you very much. Do we have any questions for Maria? We have a couple of minutes for questions. We'll ask a few more later on. Anthony? Maria, I have a question for you. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Are you familiar with the 1996 accident that killed the U.S. Secretary of Commerce, Juan Brown? Yes, and yes. Well, I, what I did for the conference, I did an uh, analysis of uh, uh, similar uh, crashes in which presidents died. Okay, okay uh, pres four presidents and uh, the Secretary of uh, United Nations. Okay, so we had five crashes I analyzed from the procedural standpoint, how they were handled from the procedural standpoint. And uh, each, all of those crashes with, where the presidents died, sabotage was involved. Sabotage was involved. And what's even, even more peculiar is that the crash in Mozambique. This was a Russian plane in Mozambique uh, where the uh, basically, and the Russians in their own report, because they joined the report of Mozambique, they said, the Russians themselves, they say, quote, if, pre if the president dies in the crash, invariably sabotage is involved. Russian quote. 